Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Clean Energy View Radio Show. Our podcasts are available on iTunes, Zoom, and you can also visit our website at www.cleanenergyview.com. If you have any questions for our guests, there are many ways you can contact the show. You can post a question on our wall on Facebook, Skype us, or contact me directly at June Stoyer on Twitter. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at info at cleanenergyview.com. Today my guest is Lyle Estel, and we're going to be talking about his book, Biodiesel Power, The Passion, the People, and the Politics of the Next Renewable Fuel. Uh, as everyone knows, the race is on to find alternative energy solutions which will eliminate our dependency upon fossil fuels. One possibility is biodiesel. Biodiesel is a domestically produced renewable fuel that can be manufactured from vegetable oils, animal fats, or recycled restaurant grease. With the number of new technologies emerging, biodiesel power has become one of the fastest growing industries because it reduces emissions, improves air quality, and can actually be made in your own home. So on today's show, I have the pleasure of welcoming expert Lyle Estill, and we're going to be talking not only about his book, but also about his company. I mean, he's doing some really fascinating things. And for those of you that are located outside the United States, I know that we've had many questions and uh, different comments through social media and whatnot about different solutions. So there's a lot to be learned, especially in this segment. So I would like to welcome to the show Mr. Lyle Estill. Thanks for having me, Jim. Oh, fantastic to have you. Uh, Lyle, can you tell our audience about yourself and also about your company? Sure. I'm the president of Piedmont Biofuels, and we are a community-scale biodiesel project in Pittsburgh, North Carolina. I started making biodiesel in my backyard in 2002. That was the last time that I went to a gas station to to, uh, fill up, and um, we would collect used fats, oils, and greases, and turn it into fuel. And I was doing it with my business partners, Rachel Burton and Lee Four, and started in the backyard, and then we became a cooperative, started making fuel cooperatively with uh, members that would show up, and they'd bring their five-gallon carboys full of grease, and we'd turn it into fuel, and ten guys would get together and make a hundred-gallon batch, and everyone would get ten gallons to go home on. And uh, we scaled up that way, so we were sort of doing cooperative fuel making. We've been out of fuel really since we began. So, you know, <laughs> I think when Rachel and I got our first batch to work, there's, you know, 10 gallons of uh, biodiesel. There were six people standing around clapping, so everyone got a gallon and a half to go home on. And um, we have just been scaling up. So, from a 10 gallon reactor to a 30 gallon reactor to a 75 gallon reactor. We had, we had another one in there that we don't talk about because it blew up. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we've scaled it up. And so we became a million gallon per year biodiesel plant, which is Piedmont Biofuels. And that's where I work today. And uh, we're still hard at it. It's been a decade. And we've been finding our way in how you would make and distribute this uh, clean burning renewable fuel to our uh, um, co op members. And, and now we also sell to oil companies. Fantastic. Uh, just out of curiosity, I noticed that you are a B Corporation. Can you tell our audience about what a B Corporation is and what made you decide that you were going to become a B Corporation? Okay. Yeah, thank you for that. That's a good question. Uh, a B Corporation is a new type of corporate structure that is for benefit, and that is for mission-driven companies that are pushing for something other than just um, you know lining the pockets of the uh, of the owners we uh, you know you sort of have a, a public sector which is the government and you have the private sector which is for profit and you have the uh, charitable sector you know churches and nonprofits and so on and there really is a new sector of American business emerging and that's sort of a fourth sector which is characterized by the B corporations we didn't really know what we were doing, but we have always been a mission-driven company. We've been driven by clean air and domestically produced fuel and renewable energy. And really what it does is it allows us to put our values over 
the bottom line. So if you were an investor in a B corporation, or I should say, if you were an investor in most corporations, the the law of the land says that what matters is making the maximum amount of return. They have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that their shareholders get maximum bang for the buck. But with a B corporation, you change that and you say, go ahead and invest your money here, but be aware that we might put our values over your return. And that way, our shareholders are aware of that going in, and uh, that's largely why we became a B Corp. It's really great to learn that uh, you did make that decision, and it is something that um, is fairly new to uh, the business world. I've been really looking to find as many B corporations as I can uh, because it's so important and it's just great that you made that decision because it really means the world of difference, especially working in a sector that has had quite the opposite, um, I guess, goals. And uh, so I think that the more companies uh, which opt to become B corporations, that evolve, or rather exist, the better. Uh, The better not only from a sense of being more responsible, but for corporate accountability, you know. Uh, Now, my next question for you is in regards to your work with Piedmont. Uh, You started off reading Joshua Tickle's book, From the Fryer to the Fuel Tank, and um, it's just really interesting that that seems to be a place where a lot of people start out. Can you talk about how the book, I guess, gave you guidance and where you took it to uh, help Piedmont become what it is today? Sure. Josh wrote a book about um, making biodiesel out of used cooking oil, and he got on a bus and drove around uh, the country sort of proselytizing and evangelizing biodiesel. And um, his book, From the Fire to the Fuel Tank, has been, um, it used to be an entry point for many, many people in the Mm -hmm. backyard biodiesel industry, including me. And uh, so I got that book off the net, and it had a recipe in it, so I followed the recipe. Josh, um, it it started out as sort of a a do-it-yourself manual, and um, it never really got updated that much. He's gone on to bigger and better things. He he wrote another book called Biodiesel America, which is a uh, great read about the um, uh, industry evolution as a whole. And then he went on to become a filmmaker, and he now travels around with uh, uh, a movie that he's made. And uh, so that uh, book is sort of obsolete at this point. It's maybe not the best uh, home brewer's guide, um, you know, 10 years later. But back in 2002, that's kind of all there was. And uh, (laughs) a lot of people entered biodiesel through that gateway. Now, where you're at today with Piedmont, I mean, you've done so much. Uh, can can you talk about the process that you've developed, um, especially with um, the enzymatic transesterification process that you've developed? Sure. So we start with fat soils and greases. And when we started uh, our commercial production at Piedmont Biofuels, we were on virgin soybean oil. So the beans would be grown down on the coastal plain, They'd be shipped up to Raleigh, North Carolina, crushed into oil, and in would come an 18-wheeler full of virgin soybean oil, and we would spin that into fuel. When soybean oil became cost prohibitive as a biodiesel feedstock, we switched to poultry fat, and we ran about 1.3 million gallons of poultry fat through our plant and turned that into fuel. And that came from a chicken factory that was 15 miles away. When poultry fat became too expensive to use as a biodiesel feedstock, we switch to waste cooking oil, which we go out and collect. So we have several hundred food service establishments, and we pick up from restaurants and cafeterias and so on, universities, and we bring that down to the plant and turn that into fuel. So today we're running on used cooking oils and some industrial scraps that we're able to buy. So we'll buy from the makeup companies from time to time, and we'll buy, you know, wet sunflower oil from um, the nutraceutical folks and and so on. So we, we get sort of the dregs and the scraps, and we run them through our plant. And today, that's where the biodiesel industry sort of ends. That's, that's as far as we go. We have developed an enzymatic process, 
which instead of using the traditional methods of making biodiesel, uses enzymes. Tomorrow night, we're going to be cutting the ribbon on our enzymatic facility in Pittsburgh. It's a new plant that we've built. And um, instead of using chemicals as a catalyst, we're using enzymes. And the beauty of using enzymes is it allows you to use crummier feedstocks. So <laughs> we'll, we'll be able to use really rough uh, fat soils and greases, stuff that has come out of the uh, grease traps or you know, distillates from uh, crushing facilities or distiller's grains, so the kinds of things that today are not very highly valued. Uh, fat soils and greases that have come out of the sewer, for instance. Uh, it's not something that we value. In fact, sometimes it's something that we landfill, and our enzymatic process can't handle that stuff. So you could say it's just been one long journey toward less expensive fats, which is why around uh, our project they kind of refer to me as the cheap fat guy. <laughs> I think what you're doing is actually remarkable. I mean, you, you've actually found a way to take something that would otherwise be discarded and utilizing it and turning it into something that not only can be used but can actually turn a profit. I think it's really, really smart and just, you know, it takes a visionary to see these types of things come to fruition. <laughs> well, thank you. It's been sort of a wild ride, and we've been at it for a long time, and it is true that um, I think we've turned in six profitable quarters in a row. So it looks like we may be out of the woods on the profitability front. It's been We've had some dark years, and we've had some uh, – it looks like we're, we're, we're heading into some better years ahead. So we finally have dialed up what it takes to make some money as a community-scale biodiesel plant. Just out of curiosity, when you make a batch of biofuel, how do you know when a batch is good and when a batch isn't good? Oh, wow. We have a really extensive lab. Uh, we're a BQ9000 accredited producer. That's a quality standard that is awarded by the National Biodiesel Board. So we have a real complicated laboratory, and we have a lot of trained, highly trained uh, technicians and laboratory folks. Um, and what happens is the lab acts as a pinch point throughout the entire process. So in terms of um, measuring the quality of the feedstock going in to the reaction, measuring the completion of the reaction itself, measuring the uh, co-products that come out of that reaction, then also uh, we wash the fuel, we dry the fuel, and um, at every point the guys that are making the fuel will pull a sample, run to the lab, wait for a number, you know, what's your number? If, if your soap number is too high, wash it again because you have to get your soaps out. If your soap number passes, you can go to the next phase. Maybe that's moisture. What's your moisture number? If it's too high, the lab says, sorry, you're stuck here until, you know, more drying, get your moisture number down. And it sort of winds through the plant at every point, and at some point the lab says, yep, you're good to go. This fuel is on spec and meets our quality standard and then it gets released into the world. And so that way we're guaranteed that we're always shipping uh, on spec, you know, high quality fuel that gives consumers a good experience. Can you explain why at this particular point uh, in time, biofuel isn't more abundant? I mean, what you're doing is fantastic, but how come people haven't done this sooner? Well, the, the, there's been a number of things. What, part of it is policy. So um, America, I don't think, is quite sure where it wants biodiesel in its energy mix. So there was a period there where Uncle Sam decided that they would put out a dollar for every gallon produced. So if you were making biodiesel, you could collect a buck from Uncle Sam. And when that happened, the industry exploded, and a whole bunch of plants got built, and a whole bunch of... Um, Operators jumped into the game, some of them with good intentions, some of them just after that dollar. And uh, then, of course, the dollar lapsed. And when that happened, a whole bunch of biodiesel plants shut down. And then it came back. And then the industry sort of opened up again. <laughs> and then it went away again. <laughs> you know, so the, 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 yeah, the yeah. policy layer has been critically important because, um, you know, biodiesel 
yeah, it's, it's just a function of what we want to power ourselves on. And traditionally, America likes to power itself on cheap fuel from oil that comes from far away from, you know, lots of countries that don't really care for us very much, <laughs> hmm. with the possible exception of Canada. Of course. <laughs> and uh, now, having said that, how has the automotive industry responded to the potential of utilizing biofuel, which uh, can be extremely abundant, especially in this country? I think it's been fairly well received by the OEMs, engine manufacturers, the fleet operators, and so on. The um, you know, we're in biodiesel, which is a little different. Um, ethanol is another biofuel. It's made from corn. It has a different uh, strategy altogether. And I think what biodiesel did is it sort of took a page out of the ethanol songbook. In the 70s, when the, uh, you know, the OPEC oil crisis hit America, big corn stepped up and said, here, we'll take care of the problem. This is this thing. At that time, mm-hmm. they called it gasohol. Now it's called ethanol. And it's problem solved. You just have to have a different pump and a different engine and a different dispenser and a different pipeline. And if you just change your everything, you can run on ethanol. And that didn't really get much traction. That kind of pitted big corn versus big, uh, versus big oil. And here we are 30 years later, and it's just not as giant an industry as it should be. Biodiesel comes along, and having seen that, they say, well, let's just get along. (laughs) So we just blend. Our product, you just dump into any diesel engine and drive. You don't have to call your mechanic. You don't have to go under the hood. You don't change your engine. You don't change your pump. You can use the same pipeline, et cetera. And so we just instantly blend with petroleum, and the petroleum industry likes that. And really, the petroleum industry is our customers. So they often will buy the biodiesel from us at 100%. That's what we do. We make what's called B100. And we sell it to the petroleum guys, and they will then blend it into lower percentage blends. So they'll sell it off as maybe B20, which means 20% biodiesel and 80% petroleum diesel. Or sometimes you'll see lower than that B2 or B5 or B50 or something like that. We're a bit of an anomaly in that we've got a cooperative membership uh, organization. We have about 400 triangle families that are running around on B100. So we have built up, sort of accidentally built up, a pretty good size B100 community. And these are people that are driving Volkswagens and Mercedes and uh, Dodge trucks and these kinds of things. And they are uh, basically off the petroleum grid, running around on B100 and um, you know, they're there for a variety of reasons. They might be motivated by air quality, or they might be motivated by political, geopolitical reasons, or they might, uh, you know, we also get, <laughs> we've got a weird collection in our co-op. We we also get the far right-wing survivalist uh, nut jobs that, um, you know, want to make their own fuel in the backyard, which we encourage, and, um, you know, want to sort of... Uh, build their self-reliance and their resilience and so on. So I get I get a full spectrum in our membership. I have I have survivalists that want to pay with Constitution Silver and I have <laughs> hippie chicks that want to trade for massage. <laughs> oh boy. All running around on B100. Well, I I think at the end of the day the most important thing is the fact that as a corporation you're doing something to actually provide a solution that is very much needed and is also a step in the right direction as far as helping us to end our dependency upon foreign countries for our energy. Now, just out of curiosity, how do you buy your resources? That's got to be really interesting, especially if you're located in the Carolinas. I mean, if you're sourcing from different restaurants and whatnot, how many restaurants are there? Oh, dear. Well, we have thousands of restaurants in Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill, where we live. And um, there's lots of people that are vying for this resource. So uh, we're not the only people that want used cooking Mm -hmm. oil. The the animal feed guys want it, and the rendering plants want it, and lots of people want to get their hands on this uh, resource. And so we um, go out and we 
we'll deploy a dumpster and show up with a vacuum truck and we'll vacuum it up and bring it down to the plant and turn it into fuel. One of the things that we have is those 400 members that I was talking about are also eaters. So we run a Partners in Sustainability program and you'll see stickers on the doors of our food service establishments. It has a little Piedmont logo and, and it lets our members know where their used cooking oil goes. And we, of course, follow that up with uh, support on the web. And also, in, uh, we're coming out with a green dining guide for our members to know uh, where they want to eat. So one of the things we can do is when we pick up a new account, we can we can guarantee new eaters, which is kind of fun because the restaurants, uh, you know, they advertise to get new faces into the restaurant. And <coughs> just by becoming a Piedmont Grease account, <laughs> we can guarantee um, our members will show up. And the other thing we do from time to time is we have grease appreciation nights. So we'll talk to a restaurant, and if they tell us that their Tuesday nights are slow, we'll hold a grease, a grease appreciation night on a Tuesday night, and you know we'll get 30 or 40 members out to each one of those in which we just uh, pack the place and um, you know have a wonderful meal together and uh, celebrate the fact that we're driving around on fuel that came from their waste. Fascinating. Now, in regards to the actual resources, what is the shelf life of the actual waste materials that you use? And also, after you've made the finished product, the actual biodiesel, how long can you can you actually store that without it turning? Right. Or does it become rancid at any point? Well, sure. So, uh, use cooking oil. You know, there are things that will act upon it. So things like water and heat and time are not really your friends. So the fresher the, the uh, oil is, the, the better. The less, uh, you know, lower temperatures it's gone through, the better. And the less interaction it's had with water, the better. So you, you do have a spectrum there of quality oil. And we've done a fair bit of education and outreach with our uh, restaurant partners on trying to maintain the, the oil quality that comes out of those restaurants. So there is definitely uh, quality there. And of course, what happens is the lower the quality of oil, the lower the yield for the biodiesel process. So if you have really rotten oil, it doesn't make a whole bunch of biodiesel, and most people don't want it. Of course, with our enzymatic technology, that's going to change. So we'll, we're going to be able to take in really rough stuff and uh, be able to process that. At the same time, once you have the finished biodiesel, you know, the, the industry says that it has a one-year shelf life, so you could put it in a tank and, and um, let it sit for a year. I would prefer six months. I, I like to see the fuel get uh, shipped and then used and turned frequently. Um, again, water is not your friend, so with petroleum products, if you have a tank that's got a little bit of water in the bottom of it and you have some petroleum diesel you throw in on top, those two get along just fine. But if you have some water in the bottom of your tank and you top it up with 100% biodiesel, the microbes in the water think that that's lunch, and they go to work on the bio and turn the tank into goo. So you have to um, be very careful that you've got clean tanks, and y you do have to know what you're doing. You need to you you need to have the right handling and use and you know, the right manufacturer spec and so on and so forth to be able to run around on V100. Well, how do you see Piedmont's new technology advancing, and um, do you see taking this enzymatic um, process and taking it to other parts of the country and also other parts of the world? I do. I, I think that in the future, biodiesel will be made enzymatically because what it does is it opens up billions of gallons of new feedstock opportunities. And, and when I say that, I mean, you know, 10 years ago, you could go to any restaurant in the Research Triangle Park of North Carolina, where I live, and you could talk to the manager and there'd be a dumpster out back and you'd say, hey, can I um, have some of that? I'm making some fuel to, to power my family. And they'd kind of look at you funny, they thought you were quirky, and they'd say, help yourself. And take all you want and come back for more. And all the dumpsters were overflowing, the lids were open, and help yourself. In just 10 short years, they're now locked, watertight, and under contract. 
<laughs> and there's you know and there and and if someone touches your grease you you know you charge them or you you mm. sue them or something like that so there's now grease wars on in just 10 years um today the trap grease is in the same boat so the restaurateur has got a grease trap out back that he pays he or she pays to get uh, cleaned out and it gets sent off to compost that uh, product today is not sought after and you pay to get rid of it and in 10 years it's going to be valuable to the restaurateur, and everybody's going to want it, and that will be due in large part to enzymatic processing technology. It's really fascinating. It kind of reminds me of the way that uh, waste, especially restaurant waste that's now being used at large-scale composting facilities where they're taking the media and they're processing it uh, so that they can turn it into uh, compost, and then you know that's it's a very lucrative industry. People think that oh, you know, compost it smells, it's not not anymore. I mean, that's true. you it have is a valuable valuable soil amendment. You know, here's the thing: there is no waste in nature, right? Waste is entirely a human construction. The, the only thing that makes something waste is that you can't get paid for it. Right? So if I have to pay to get rid of it, it's waste. If you'll give me a dollar for it, it's no longer waste. It, that's an entirely human invention that doesn't actually exist in nature. And I think that we should be mindful of that because you know we need to move to a zero-waste paradigm in our manufacturing and in our living on this garden planet. Yeah, it, it's just absolutely amazing that we've gone from one extreme to the other, and now we're kind of back, and we're trying to figure out, okay, well, how can we now take things that would normally wind up in the landfill, utilize it, and help uh, or help take these materials so that we can actually benefit society, but also limit the negative impact on the planet. And I just think that everything that you're doing at Piedmont is just, Fantastic, and so now the uh, the ribbon cutting ceremony is tomorrow. You said, yeah, ribbon cutting tomorrow at uh, well, the, the politician speeches start at three. We have Senator Kay Hagan from North Carolina um, speaking, and um, we have Joe Job, the uh, CEO of the National Biodiesel Board, will be in town from Missouri, and um, we have uh, the governor's uh, office is represented and a bunch of people. The, uh, the Biofuel Center of North Carolina will be uh, present and speaking. And so um, we've got some speeches, and then we're going to have uh, ribbon cutting, and then there will be some local food and some local spirits, and uh, it will be a party that goes into the night. <laughs> Sounds like a wonderful and well-deserved event and uh, congratulations. Uh, this is just really fantastic to find out about. Uh, and Lyle, can you give our audience your website and also uh, tell them about your other books that you've written? Okay, so uh, you can find out about Piedmont Biofuels at biofuels.coop, dot C-O-O-P, we're a dot co-op. And um, you can find out about my writing stuff over at lyleestel.com. And uh, I, uh, Biodiesel Power it was my first book. That tells the story of moving from the backyard into co-op. And uh, my second book is called Small as Possible, Life in a Local Economy. And it talks about a number of strategies that we've deployed. And the third one is Industrial Evolution, all published by New Society Press. Thank you so much. And, well, thank you for coming on the show today. It's been fabulous just learning about everything that you've been doing. And uh, I, once again, wish you the best of luck, especially tomorrow with the ceremony. Thank you so much, Jim. And, folks, thank you for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Clean Energy View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon, everyone.